Uh, welcome to the virtual future stage at Future First 2018. Uh, my name is Matt Haler, uh, and I'm joined today by Brett Frischman. Uh, virtual futures first occurred at the University of Warwick during the mid-90s, and it arose as a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. It cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. Discussions like this helped to complete the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and start work on the first. So, let's begin. Uh, today, as I said, we're joined by Brett. Uh, he's the Charles Widger Professor in Law, Business and Economics at Villanova University, with a background in intellectual property and internet law. Uh, and with Evan Selinger, uh, he wrote the book, Re-Engineering Humanity, uh, and that's what we're here to discuss today. Um, the book outlines a number of ways in which we're manipulated by the technologies that we use, um, but not just the technologies themselves, but also the ways that we engage with them. Um, but I really appreciated it wasn't an anti-technology book, uh, but you're really away, aware of the ways in which the things that we're using every day aren't neutral uh, and could lead us down quite a bad path if they go unchecked. Uh, and so I wondered, what do you think are some of the most significant technologies at the moment for changing how we behave right now? That's a great question. So the, the, the book canvases a number of different technologies. And so when we think about manipulation or technologies who, that are affecting who we are and how we behave uh, in our lives, we often tend to think about, you know, what is the technology? It may be the smartphone. Uh, it may be social networks. Um, and in the, in the book, we talk a lot about how it's actually a, a collection of, di of different digital network technologies that, that share a whole host of different features uh, and sort of um, affect us in, so in subtle ways. And so, uh, for example, when the Cambridge Analytica story uh, hit the news, uh, I don't know, I guess it's over a month now, uh, but when it hit the news, uh, everyone sort of jumps on that particular story. Uh, and in and, and, and our perspective in the book, it's, you know, Cambridge Analytica is one of many hundreds, maybe even thousands of different similarly situated entities be doing, engaging in very similar practices on top of the uh, uh, Facebook network. And so then you might think, oh, well, then it's Facebook. It's Facebook. Let's focus on Facebook. That's the problem we need to solve. But it turns out that Facebook is just one of many, many different uh, 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 platforms uh, at the applications layer of the internet uh, that are similarly sort of shaping who we are, how we interact with each other, um, and enabling the various companies and, and entities like uh, Cambridge Analytica. Um, and it goes well beyond search. So, I mean, it goes well beyond social networking. We can talk about search. We could talk about e-commerce. We can talk about contracting. Um, but then you might think, it's, oh, it's all of those things happening at the applications layer of the internet and above. Um, but as we talk about in the book, well, no, actually, when you think about the deployment of wearable technologies, um, oh, and even and there's a whole chapter talking about the use of things like Fitbit, although it's called an activity watch, in the schools. And so you start talking about ed tech. Well, ed tech is not always about internet enabled, internet connected devices, but it's about digital network technologies that are shaping how uh, teachers and children and administrators are interacting and behaving and learning and developing within the context of a school system. And it turns out that many, there are similar features with what's happening in ed tech and schools as there are with when we talk about social network in a variety of other places. So that's what the, the book, it's, there's a whole host of different technologies. That's really interesting. So it's not that there are these few technologies that we need to be taking down. It's actually we need to be thinking about these systemic issues that are recurring and that have uh, similar characteristics in them. Is this what you guys mean by um, techno-social engineering? Yes. So, so that's great. Yeah. So, so techno-social engineering is this sort of almost an umbrella concept that we use to sort of, so the techno-social means that we're talking about both technologies and social institutions. So laws uh, and, and social institutions are technological often in terms of their application, uh, their te technological tools that are created by humans. Um, and at the same time, most technologies have a social component. So we sort of use techno-social to sort of talk about the, the broad category of tools and technologies that we're interested in. Um, and the engineering is also sort of an umbrella term which captures things like nudging, influence, manipulate. And I can go on a whole bunch of different ways in which the techno-social tools are affecting human behavior, human thinking, human capabilities. Um, and there are subtle and important differences and connotations as we move across those words. Nudging is a little different than influence or manipulation. But for our purposes, the differences aren't what we're focusing on. We're focusing on the similarities. Yeah, yeah. 
The book has a series of these really interesting case studies. You mentioned the Activity Watch, which seems like an unexpected place, perhaps, to think about these kind of questions. Uh, one of the chapters I was really struck by um, was about click-through contracts. Again, that wasn't where I was expecting a book called Reengineering Humanity to start. Like, when I click, I agree that that does something to me. Why was that such an important case study for you? Right. Well, maybe it's because I'm a lawyer, and I'm a law professor, and so I teach about the law quite a bit. But also, I think it's the example that resonates with most people. So lots of, most of us, are familiar with the click, click to contract arrangement. Um, but we often don't think about how it affects our behavior. Right? What, what do you do when you see an I agree button? You, you, the, the stimulus, we, we click I agree in a rather automatic sort of way. Uh, perfectly rational to do in that context by design. And what's interesting about the click, click I agree contract is uh, it not only is in the, in the immediate sense, we do it in a perfectly rational way, we behave automatically, um, but we start to see that it's pervasive, right? It's not just used on websites, right? But it creeps to uh, things like apps on your phone, uh, smart home, uh, t uh, the, your smart TV in your home, um, and every future supposedly smart device we'll see on the IoT, the Internet of Things, will likely be mediated through some form of electronic contracting, right? And so the be even though the context shifts, right, the third parties and, and hidden parties that are in the background may be different across those different contexts, right? The behavior of at least most people most of the time remains the same, click, I agree. So in that sense, it, it's a useful example to sort of illustrate a, a number of different concepts that we expand upon in the book. Um, it's also useful for connecting to a very simple idea in the book, which is that we're sort of interested in when do various technologies lead us to behave like simple machines, right? And so in the later part of the book, we talk about these reverse Turing tests. I don't know that we really want to go into that right now, but the, the point is you feel almost machine-like when you're interacting with these, this interface. And it's designed, the architecture of the design of those interface, the technological aspect of it, but also the legal, right? The social legal rules behind electronic contracting also sort of shape what it's like. And so it's very familiar to people and it sort of helps illustrate and set up other points in the book. That's really cool. Yeah, the, the worries around things becoming automatic and it seemed that that was something that came up again and again. It was like, we're, we're getting used to this. This is becoming something that becomes a default. And that worry with when we stop becoming reflective, when we stop thinking, and how that might start to leak out into these other areas of life, that, that was striking. You, you, you start to build up that case. I'm nodding along and I'm really persuaded. And then there is this rhetorical move where you're like, and that impacts our humanity. Um, and how do you see going from, oh, it's okay just to like click through a contract and that's happening on my TV, to actually challenging what it means to be us as human beings? Like, how, what's that move? Well, that, it's, it's a hard move. And, and Evan and I spent over a year, maybe it was two or three years, sort of trying to figure out and grapple with that move. Like moving from identifying how things are affecting us to sort of when it matters. Um, and so it, we ended up sort of focusing on uh, human capabilities certain human capabilities that matter uh, from the perspective of humanity. So we, we talk about humanity in a very particular way later in the book. And we say what it means to be, to be human is something we might describe uh, in evolutionary biological terms, in terms of what are the capabilities that differentiate Homo sapiens from other species. And then we can kind of get into a very sophisticated analysis of that. But the, the bottom line is uh, we, ha we have evolved uh, the capability uh, to think in long leash terms, to think in, term, in long terms about things that don't exist. We imagine things and we can construct collectively because we have language, we can communicate about those things that don't exist. That's where laws come from, right? That's where social institutions, that's where myths come from, right? We can create these things and in, and in doing so, over time, we can sort of engineer our and reconstruct a built environment within which we live, within which we develop, right? And, it's, and then what matters about being human, the second part, right? Not just what it means to be human, but what matters about being human is how we exercise that capability collectively across generations, right? So we sustain certain thinking capacities. We sustain our capability to participate in democracy by, by sort of sustaining our free will. We protect our free will, our ability to author our lives for ourselves and not have who we are and what we're capable of doing determined by someone else, 
right? And that's sort of this fundamental shift. And so then when we're trying to evaluate technologies, right, we're thinking about, well, how do technologies affect some of those basic capabilities that seem to matter uh, across generations, recognized collectively in different cultures and different generations to be sort of what's meaningful. And so there's thinking capacities, uh, the ability to sociality, to relate to each other, how we can kind of relate. Um, uh, then things like free will um, and autonomy and agency. Um, and we recognize that other people, other cultures, other groups, people may have different sets of capabilities they think matter, um, but we think they can apply our analysis uh, usefully. So yeah, this isn't about the maintenance of our culture as it is now. This is actually thinking cross-culturally and actually thinking about fundamentally what defines us as a species and recognizing, at least it seemed to me, recognizing that we're in a place where we can shape what that might be. And that's tremendously powerful and that has been something that we've done productively historically, um, but that it has the capacity to be taken over or derailed by some of the things that we're up to uh, at the moment, right? Yeah, so as we, you know, if, as we build ubiquitous smart systems, supposedly smart systems, right? These sort of supposedly intelligent smart systems to manage more and more of our lives, whether it's in the home, in the workplace, in the hospital, on public transit, in the public parks, on your body, in your clothes, right? Um, we're, we're, we outsource various aspects of how we think how we relate to each other. You know, do I read your social cues to tell if you're following me and you're actually interested? Or do I rely on an app that's actually measuring different, taking different measures and helping me and give me a little message in my ear about whether or not to stop and check or do something else, right? That how we relate to each other. We can outsource so much to smart systems. The question is, should we? When should we? How should we? What do you think are some of the implications of thinking about the human body and the human mind and cognition in terms of efficiency, in terms of it just being like another cog in a machine. Um, there are plenty of schools of thought that see us as being entangled with the world in all sorts of ways. My background is in uh, 4E cognition and thinking about how we always scaffold our thinking with other people, with technologies. It's something every culture does with stories and writing and weapons and tools. That to me seems to be part of what defines our humanity is that kind of scaffolding. So what do you think is going on here when we make that extra move of offloading as efficiency and we start to use this language of machinery? Right, so that's, I mean, again, the 100% agree that the scaffolding matters. Like, if we're going to live in an interdependent, interdependent society, we are going to have to build tools that, we, that help us relate to each other, right? We're not gonna, we don't wanna throw away the technology, throw away the tools or any of those things. Super important, um, and it's part of what sustains humanity are those tools. But the, so the point about efficiency, we talk a bit about what's driving us down the path we're on, right? What are the, what are the sort of powerful logics that sort of lead us to sort of be, uh, you know, excited about often the, the smart systems we're building, right? A lot of the justification, in other words, for building smart techno-social systems to manage different aspects of our lives are that they're efficient, right? They can reduce transaction costs. They can make things happen more quickly, right? They can maximize productivity. Uh, you know, in Taylor's time, when he was talking, Taylorism was talking about scientific management of human beings in the workplace, right? Like optimizing human labor, right? Making people more productive was enabled by data, right? And management techniques. Well, just think about all the different kinds of human labor, even outside of the workforce, right? So I labor to stay fit. Right? I labor to, uh, to relate, social labor, relate to people uh, uh, socially or in my home with my family. Right? A lot of those other kinds of things could be more productively managed if we outsource to technology. So a lot of the logic driving the development and deployment of smart technical systems right, is efficiency, maximizing human labor productivity, and then the value proposition at the end from, for, in many cases, and we talk about this quite a bit in the book, is bliss. Right? Happiness, satiation. And it's often happiness, satiation, subjective experience that's itself engineered. Where what it is we want, what it is that makes us happy is, is sort of engineered through the techno-social environment that we're in. So we learn to want very little. We learn to be satiated with sort of, for example, you know, just to sort of click through and quick sort of short bits of attention. Yeah, yeah. And there's a difference between happiness and satiation, right? Like happiness being a richer uh, interactive, whereas we can feel satiated 
relatively quickly, and that's right. way easier to engineer. Yeah, and it, exactly, that's 100% right. So we should say it that way too. Like that, that's a great way to put it, right? Happiness can be of, of, of different tiers. You know, you can have higher or lower pleasures if you want to go back and, and talk about it that way. You can think about satiation as very cheap bliss. But in the book, we make sort of a provocative claim, and I recognize it, it's provocative. We say, but what's the cheapest way, the efficient way to make a billion people happy, right? to maximize their happiness at lowest cost. So efficiency coupled with happiness production. And it's cheap bliss, it's satiation, it's engineering their preferences so they expect very little and then barely surpassing that. And, right, and that, that is a uh, unattractive world for Evan and I, and we explain why we think that's not the world we, we would choose to build. But we also recognize and give due credit to the possibility that there are others out there who would say this is a world we ought to build. I would build, you know, maybe some people would plug into that world or plug into the experience machine as Nozick talked about so long ago. But the difficult question is maybe some would plug in if they given the choice, right? And maybe some wouldn't. But should we build a world where everyone is plugged in, whether or not they have an opportunity to choose to do so? And that, I think, is the sort of the end, end state or the destination that Evan and I are trying to sort of help uh, articulate and, and sort of help people to see. Well, let, let's end on that point then. There's a, a really nice line in the book about emergent Taylorism, that people aren't designing dystopia. People are designing efficient, optimized systems that people appreciate. And so, but there is a, a, a negative trajectory we, we, that we can get onto very easily. Um, how do we resist? Like that seems to be where the book ends up going, is starting to think about resistance to this. What kind of measures can we take as individuals and societies not to slip into right. this? Right, so that we have, uh, it's funny, we have a conclusion that probably should have been like a 15-page conclusion, but it turned out to be like a 45-page conclusion, which is really just another chapter. And that's what that whole last chapter is really about. Um, and you know, much like diagnosing the problems, we're very critical of people who sort of say, well, the problem is engineered addiction, or the problem is data and privacy, or the pro when it's really a, a sort of interdependent set of complex problems across lots of different technologies. The same is true on the solution side. So we sort of say there's no silver bullet, there's no single thing, um, but there's sort of a, con a, a, a number of different uh, things we ought to be doing or thinking about doing from a solution, from the perspective of solutions. So we talk about macro, meso, and micro level things, but you know, at, the, at the highest level, we say the most important constitutional question of the 21st century very well might be, how do we sustain our freedom to be off? And by that, we mean our freedom to be free from engineered determinism, where most, if not all, of our lives are determined by the systems within which we live. Right? So that, that is at the very high level. And then to sort of take that high level idea and make it more practical, we talk about sort of the movement of environmental humanism. And sort of we sort of spell out what that might look like, which is sort of recognizing that who we are is intimately and unavoidably connected to the built environment, the environments we build. So again, technologies are not going anywhere. It's about how to think about when we're building technologies, we're also building ourselves our children and our future generations, the lives they can possibly live. Um, and then we go one step lower and we talk about strategies uh, for sort of undercutting the efficiency productivity logic. Um, we talk about engineering friction into techno-social systems. Uh, we talk about things like um, uh, taking the conventional wisdoms in economics and engineering from the 90s and the 2000s and basically questioning them. I mean, sort of seamless interconnection is a great idea Right in the 90s and 2000s, when you're talking about internet uh, and digital network technology, but you know, in the context of increasingly sub smart systems, maybe we need to uh, have seamful interconnection. Right? Well, maybe we need to start thinking about like my smart toaster in my home need not have a seamless connection to my smart transportation system, the smart grid, or the hospital, or someone else. Right? So we might want to think about where we engineer in seams between smart systems where we can engineer transaction costs that slow down uh, 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 otherwise efficient, fast processes. You know, maybe we want to, so there's a whole host of things like that that we talk about. Fantastic. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, I just want to end then uh, with this reminder for those interested in the future. Some things that may seem imminent or inevitable may never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not contingent on our capacity for the prediction that Brett's been discussing. 
Although sometimes, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable comes of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. Uh, I hope you feel that you've done some of this today. And please join me uh, in thanking the incredible speaker, Brett Frischman. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.